it's just, yeah. Falls in the falls under the line. Yeah. So. Um, so what? So once we get to these areas, so like you go back here, so it, it ends up in the primary um, somatosensory cortex, right? So once it gets there, what does the brain do with this? So it integrates it and verifies it with other sensory information. You guys need to keep in mind that the brain is getting all sorts of like sensory input. It's you know just getting mechanoreceptor input, thermo, light, sound. Every, you know, and I, and I forget, I didn't add the sound part to it, but everything is coming to it at once and it's integrating all of this stuff and trying to make um, a decision what's going on. Um, so that's where these inner neurons come to play. Um, they're they're going to associate, they're going to connect certain parts of brain together with um, the important parts like the motor areas when they start formulating a plan. Um, so some of the important areas of the brain that were introduced on Monday that are kind of important in the efferent output is the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. These are the two that are going to be helpful in making a plan. Who remembers? Now I don't know if we do. Go ahead. Well, when the frontal lobe is used to, uh, Mr. Larry said that the frontal lobe is one that they will plan on. Right, right, and you're you're absolutely right. So I, though the frontal lobe is, you're like you know planning, judgment, and stuff like that. Um, and I'm, I'm referring to like the major ones in like actually motor, motor kind of motor skills, you know, um, planning, planning in the front and judgments more, like okay, I'm gonna plan a vacation, handle my finances, kind of stuff like that. But you're right, like not to say that they're that's probably not involved in something like this, but um, there's there's a lot of areas in the brain that. And that's where these inner neurons come to play that communicate with each other to kind of get the best plan. But the two major ones when it comes to like how to move your body in response to sensory input is going to be uh, these two areas. Um, so who does who remember what the basal ganglia? And that I don't I don't remember him on Monday going into too much detail, so I won't be surprised. Okay, we'll talk about what that does. What about the cerebellum? I know he talked a little bit about that. Balance, 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 coordination. balance and coordination. Good. That's great. You guys got your memories. Um, so it begins with the, in the brain with planning. Um, so the basal ganglia is responsible for planning and execution of movements in the order that they should occur. Okay. So that's kind of going to be like, even though you know, it's, it's hard to think that you would think this, but this is what's going on. Like. If you're gonna walk, you're like, you know, right foot, left foot, my arm's gonna move like this, you know, other muscles are gonna move like that. Um, you know, everything's gonna work in such a way that it's gonna be coordinated, okay? This is what the basal ganglia does, walking. Um, but the cerebellum is responsible for rate, range, force, and direction of these movements once they're executed. So this, you know, there's different ways you can walk. Basal ganglia tells you how you're gonna walk. Cerebellum tells you, you know, the way in which you're gonna walk. So you know, are you gonna be walking normally like this? Or are you gonna be marching? You know, you can pick your legs up in a lot of different ways. Or are you gonna be standing on some ice so you're gonna be like carefully tiptoeing your way across? You know, so the cerebellum is gonna control all these different things, um, which is important because you can't walk on ice the same way you can on solid ground or you're gonna fall. Um, so, the, we also got to remember that the efferent division um, can be characterized into the voluntary and the involuntary system, nervous system. So, and the other words for that was somatic and the autonomic nervous system. Will you guys remember what the autonomic nervous system dealt with? So that, oh, she's. Fear. That, that's, yeah, no, that's. That's true. Yeah, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, it contributes to like your flight or fight. Um, that's correct. So um, your autonomic is primarily going to be your, um, your your organs, your tissues, and your glands. Okay. So it's going to that, and then finally, and then with your voluntary, anything that's voluntary or things that you actively control, 
is going to require the final output to be skeletal muscle, okay? So if you think anything that's controlled with skeletal muscle, that's probably something that I can control, okay? Everything else, like your heart, that's a different type of muscle. That's um, smooth muscle, any type of glands, like your sweat glands, you, you really don't really control when you sweat, you just sweat. Um, those things like that, those are involuntary. Can you guys think of the one organ in your body that's, it's not, I don't know if it's the only one, but one that demonstrates voluntary and involuntary behavior? Is it a major one? Is it lungs? Lungs, right. So you can actively choose when to breathe, but if you don't breathe on your own, your body will, your body actually has chemoreceptors um, that measure the level of carbon dioxide in your blood, and when those get too high because you're not breathing enough, you'll just t assume and take over and do autopilot. Yeah. Um, yeah, so sometimes it'll do that when you yawn, um, and then sometimes without you know, you know, when you go to sleep, it, it takes over because none of us think when we sleep. When we sleep. <laughs> so, um, so the pathway of the efferent system is just the opposite of the afferent system. Um, it goes, it starts out in the brain, heads down the spinal cord, down the, um, down to a peripheral nerve, and then the end what is skeletal muscle. So I wanted to go back up here and kind of challenge you guys. So looking at this picture right here, I want you guys to, now we all know that the spinal cord is important, but can you tell me why like why, after kind of what you've learned so far, what you've been hearing, why really is the spinal cord very important in the nervous system? Because if something was happening to the spinal cord, the nerves wouldn't be able to mm -hmm. the signals to the brain, so you wouldn't be able to feel why something happened here. It connects all your nerves. So, okay, good. Wait, you said that. The spinal cord is like the roadway, so um, the nerves can get to where they gotta go. So if you don't have a road, you can't go where you need to be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What what is, what do you think? What kind of as far as the amount of information? Like, let's say, what kind of like what kind of sensory? Uh, let me say, how much information do you think nerves have here versus have in here? I don't think they have as much as they have in this black spinal. Why? Why do you think that? I don't know, because they get connected to the main source, I guess. I don't know. Okay. You guys are sort of get yeah, you're you're getting you have the right idea. But so as you as nerves and this is probably because it wasn't um didn't explain it well to you, but as nerves uh you know see the, how they're branching out and you know how they communicate with each other through synapses, correct? And at any given syn synapse, a nerve is able to have other nerves like give them information, right? So as nerves branch their way up here, they're getting more and more information. And by the time they get to the spinal cord, they have received tons of information. So this, this area right here could have information about this whole part of the body, right? So you have oh, like a ton of information that's going through here. And like I said, you have sensory input going up and efferent information going down. So um, where do you guys think the most, if you were to hurt your back and hurt your spinal cord, where would it be most detrimental? At the top. Where would it be hurt more? Lower body? Why Why do you think so? Because if you hurt, like, you're talking like this here, right here. It means like everything with love on your, your brain will be able to get done uh, sensory detail. So, in other words, you said if you hurt yourself right here, that'd be oh. terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now he, you, he said he's saying a different thing. You say where at? At the top. At the top. Oh, yeah, you messed up. You said at the top. Yeah. yeah. Okay, why is that? <laughs> because then it would take your legs out and. Uh, okay. I like that. I like that. <laughs> does, it, does everyone see what? Oh, I'm sorry. What's your name, sir? Wesley. Wesley. Okay. Wesley. Wesley. Uh, brought up. Yeah. 
Yeah. You, does anyone just you read? Okay. So, um, um, so like you, you like you said back there, yeah, I didn't catch your name either. Chris. Chris. Chris said, you know, in the lower, that's still that's pretty bad, like the Lucia legs. But at the top, like I said, it's all these information, all the information from your legs is going up here. Things are as they come towards the spinal cord, they start heading up, and things start heading down um, from your brain. So as we get, if we go from the top, that's why if you dive and you break your neck, it's worse because you're knocking out not only your arms, but you're knocking out your legs as well. Because that's all that information. So if you fall, you fall. Huh? But then you can break your tailbone falling on your left hand. Oh, the right tailbone. Well, this is it. This is the interesting thing. See this? The spinal cord ends about about uh, L3, which is the third lumbar. Um, vertebra, which is about right here, um, and then you see how this they all kind of branch out from mm -hmm. the cauda equina, like we talked about the horse's tail. So, <laughs> this your tailbone is about right here. You break your tailbone, you're not going to hurt any spinal cord, actually. So, you could fall. it'd be better to fall on your tailbone and break it, and you won't, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. You'll be fine as far as me. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how long it takes for a t broken oh, tailbone to heal, but probably took a while. Oh, it's fine. Let's. Let's talk about, uh, I want to talk to you on motor units, okay? So that's good. You guys you guys are integrating and you're getting this really well. You know when they say they were born, they don't have all their motor, like, they all their motor skills? Right. Are they not born with all their sensory skills too? They, they're born with sensory skills, um, but the thing is they're, they're immature, you know, like, so like their, their brain is like a new, brand new slate, you know, so that's why babies are, they're like, all the things are starting to develop, but that's why they're touching things, they're putting things in their mouth, they're, they're, they want to taste everything, they want to feel everything, um, you know, they're crawling, a lot, a lot of their sensory too, like when they start learning how to walk, you know, it, it, your, your development doesn't even change to a little, 10 or 12, you know, you're still, you know, kid, kids, little kids are jumping around, they're jumping on their beds, you know, they're doing all, they all sorts off. of stuff. No, it, it, and a lot of it is really your brain just, I mean, I don't know if your brain's really directing it, but your brain is benefiting from all these different activities because it's learning how your body, and as you grow, how to balance it, how to, you know, different things feel. Um, so, you're really never in a finished state, should I say. Um, you know, we're all still learning different, our bodies are learning different things. Um, Sensory things are becoming more sophisticated as we get older. So, <laughs> and I, am I in the way you got that mic? Uh, okay, I'm in the way. Okay. So, um, so, yeah, so okay, so now we're on the motor units. So now we've gotten to the point where we got to the motor, the motor neuron, right? So, peripheral nerve, we're down to the muscle, and we're down to this motor unit. So a motor unit now is defined as a, a single motor neuron and the muscle fibers that it innervates. Um, the number of fibers that a motor unit innervates will predict the natural function of the muscle. So a few fibers that it innervates, which I'll show with the picture because it's kind of like what are you talking about. The innervates will be involved with more like fine movements. And, and if those with like mini fibers, those are called large motor units, are going to be involved with powerful movements, okay? 